Welcome back to our video series on Design a Computer from Scratch. This is part six of the series. If you haven't watched the previous videos, they're up. But this particular video should be shorter than the last couple, hopefully. And it concerns designing the peripheral bus. So the peripheral is where the I.O. devices, like a UART or a register for external register, LEDs, push buttons, anything like that would be located on the peripheral bus. And just as a refresher, our basic design from part two in the architecture was that there's only eight address bits, allowing for up to 256 I.O. devices. And those address bits come directly from D7 down to D0 of the instruction itself. So they're easy to find and generate. They're directly picked off the CPU instruction. The data, we also said, only goes in and out of the register file. So writes come out of the register file, reads go into the register file. And that register number is also easily selected by the D11 down to D8 bits of the instruction. Uh, there's eight bits of separate data in and out connections, so there's no need to tri-state. If you hooked up to a traditional peripheral, due to saving pins, they would have shared input and output on one pin, and they would have a direction control pin. But with this design, it's not necessary to do that. We have separate data in and out buses, eight bit connections out to the devices or in from the devices. So it's it's pretty convenient, makes things a lot easier to use externally, meaning externally to the CPU. Uh, we decided we're going to have one write strobe because most of the peripherals that we have from Multicomp and other places are designed with a one clock wide write strobe and that's a 50 megahertz clock so it's a skinny little 20 nanosecond pulse but that's more than enough since everything is inside of the FPGA. We also need a read strobe and that read strobe is going to be two clocks wide. Some things need a wider read strobe. Uh, nothing I know of is harmed by having a wider read strobe, but that gives more time for the data to come into the device. Uh, let's make the signals for those in our signal list. And those signals are peripheral address, back to the NANLAN convention of W for wires, just as if they were wires on a breadboard, and that's an 8-bit peripheral address. This is sort of inspired by the Z80 with the I.O. instructions that work on 256 locations. I think you can do more with the Z80, but that's the typical use of them. It should be plenty of peripherals for a small processor like this. If you're beyond 256, you could look at having a register select or something like that and use some addresses for that register. But that's really probably unnecessary for anything you would do with a CPU of this sort. Uh, it's more, made more for moving data, 8-bit data around between various peripherals and offloading work from uh, maybe a bigger processor perhaps. The next lines are data in, or data from the CPU and data to the CPU. And try to use names like this to make it obvious. If it was just peripheral data out and peripheral data in, you'd be sitting there wondering, well, which one goes which way? And then those two strobes, the write and read strobes, peripheral write and peripheral read. Uh, this requires a data mux into the CPU for I.O. reads, output of the ALU, and the ROM for immediate instructions. So any of these three can be sources, but note there's a different instruction to select which particular thing is being done. So if you're doing a read, you turn on the mux input for data from the external peripheral, that should say peripheral. If it's doing an arithmetic operation like an AND register immediate, it would select this input. And if it's doing a ROM, it would select for register, uh, for load register immediate, it's in the, the immediate values in the bottom eight bits. And that would select uh, with the LRI instruction. So a simple opcode decode will set whatever channel needs to be selected. Uh, we were going to do it later in the video, but let's just to toss it in here. Let's do the opcode decoder so we have these four opcodes and our other opcodes decoded. So we have some of the signals we already need. And that looks like this, uh, a different signal for each opcode. 
it's literally just true if the opcode is that particular value. And this, of course, matched the mapping we had back in the assembler design in the previous ROM generation slide. Of course, it has to match because if these values didn't match what your assembler generated, uh, the, the executable, if your assembler, assembler generates, it just wouldn't execute correctly. We could probably move all these into a constants file. It would be a smart thing to do and share it between the different functions. But for now, we'll just leave it simple. There's only eight separate, uh, seven, excuse me, seven separate instructions we have right now. If you executed an instruction that was like, say, all zeros not in the table here, it would just do a no op. It would count through the four states of the gray code machine and increment the PC and move on to the next instruction. So we already have a no op built in, but if later we want to recapture, we're using all 16 locations. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can implement an, a no op. You could turn it into a sort of a pseudo code and have it do something like an IO write to a register. Well, that doesn't let's say register 9 we've hard coded as 0 so it doesn't do anything so if you did an IO write of register 9 well not IO write that wouldn't work um, if you uh, I, I'm oh if you did a if you did uh, excuse me do a and register immediate of register 9 with anything it'll still leave that register 9 as 0 so we could do a pseudo op for that and say hey if I get a no op then I replace it with an and register immediate or a register uh, register 9 and that would do nothing to register 9 but it would go through a cycle so f a free op code could be all done in the assembler it wouldn't really be an op code down on the machine that does anything it would just create a bogus instruction but for the moment anything that's not implemented just steps through the PC when, when it comes time so those controls are as noted here in the signals decoded and they're found on the ROM data itself the top nibble it's 15 down to 12 and whatever value it is if it's not that it's zero so they'll only come on for one instruction per cycle unless it's a no op then it doesn't come on for anything that means we have to play with the now that we have that we can play with the data mocks to the register into the register file if the instruction is load register immediate those that immediate value from the ROM will go into the register file if it's an IO read it'll take that peripheral data to the CPU and put it in the register file and if it's an ALU operation like and register immediate it'll take that ALU output and put it into the register file so that takes care of it. The only thing we didn't have was the ALU out. So for now, let's just pretend like we have an ALU, create the signal for it, and set the value to zero, zero, as if we had ended something with zero. But it'll take care of a dangling signal. We don't want to leave it dangling. And we'll later replace it when we build the ALU. So connecting up the peripheral bus is pretty simple. We'll make signals for it, but if you hooked up directly for peripheral address on your peripheral to the ROM data, that would do the job. Uh, if this is pushed up to a higher level, these could be grabbed or this could be grabbed. And for now, we won't do any actual peripheral writes. We'll just set the strobes to zero. But the data from the CPU always comes out of the register file. You can only do IO writes from the register file. And uh, that's pretty much all you got to do for that so how would we test that it's pretty tough to test it without having a peripheral uh, but we could do something to test it the strobes themselves in the previous slide we just set the strobes to zero but if you had a real peripheral you would need to have those strobes and that would require the timing unit the gray code machine which we're going to build later on that would require that to be running and we don't have that um, but we could create a program that loops on IO write and we can see the IO write signal on the LED but again it wouldn't be too meaningful it's about a 50 50 I should say 50 about a 50 50 chance of verifying it's correct and really no ALU is needed for what we've got so far 
So in summary, what we've done is created a peripheral bus with address, data in and out, and the controls. They're not really doing anything yet. We really haven't tested them yet. But we did hook them up so the register file data marks takes accommodation for them. And really creating that register file input data box was the main thing we did here. And just identifying the signals that will hook up the peripherals to make them easy to find later on. You don't have to say, oh, that's these bits of the instruction itself. It, we just gave it a name of a, 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 a peripheral address or W peripheral address. The ALU isn't designed yet, so we just put a fake value on there. And peripheral read data, we did hook that up. Uh, again, lack of a timing block makes this hard to test, so we really didn't do any testing. But this does compile, so syntax is likely correct. Uh, did check in this peripheral bus. Again, this is misnumbered from, from the video number. It's actually part six, but this is where you'll find it up in GitHub. I'll hopefully put it notes in the show notes for all of the code. And that's a particular branch. If you go back to the main, you can find the current build, which as of the time of this video includes conditional branching and all of the instructions that we defined in the, in the very beginning of the video. It'll probably grow with time, so I'll try to create more branches as things go on. Uh, there's also a release created up there with conditional branching working as well if you want to grab the release and use that. And as usual, the same top-level entity is CPU001.VHD. Thanks for watching, and I hope you appreciate a shorter video. If you want more information, you can see our wiki pages for these products, and we have YouTube videos on them as well. We have a store in Tindy where we sell all of our cards. Thanks for watching our video, and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.